Hello and welcome to this webinar uh, entitled IP for Entrepreneurs, that's intellectual property uh, for entrepreneurs. Uh, my name is Joe Hetzema. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Uh, I have degrees in uh, undergraduate and master's degrees from MIT uh, and a law degree from uh, Harvard. Uh, I've been involved in the starting of over 100 uh, companies, primarily um, uh, high-tech companies. And I've been asked to uh, give a talk uh, to entrepreneurs about uh, the role of intellectual property and how they should approach it. My uh, uh, presentation is focused um, mostly on US law. The law for IP varies country by country, although there are several uh, themes that are consistent. And as you can see from the slide, um, the um, uh, this is for background education only, in the sense that um, uh, legal matters are very fact specific. So you shouldn't, excuse me, I'm having notices on my computer here. Uh, legal um, uh, advice is very fact specific. So you should take this as a uh, overview from a, a business uh, perspective, uh, and perhaps to put you in a position to uh, be able to have a discussion uh, with your legal counsel uh, in a more uh, educated way. So with that, let me move to the next slide. The, the topics here that we're gonna to cover today uh, are five. We're gonna talk a little bit about what the value of intellectual property is, why should you care, uh, the different types of IP, uh, a little bit about uh, IP strategy, how to think about uh, dealing with intellectual property, uh, and then patent basics in the U.S. Uh, on the assumption that uh, some of you may eventually come to the U.S. and certainly would want to know about the U.S. patent system, which is one of the most advanced in the world. And then some practical advice um, on how to deal with all this as an entrepreneur. So the question I would put to all of you is, what is the entrepreneur's primary job? And when I ask people that, there are a whole range of answers that come that include so developing a product, uh, innovating, and, and doing this and that. Those are all the, the, the specific steps. But I think the primary job that I would like you to think about is uh, your job is to create and capture value. If what you're doing doesn't create value, uh, then you don't have a business, you don't have a sustainable, you don't have a venture. And, and yet, if you create value and you can't capture some of that value, then you don't have a sustainable business or a sustainable venture. And so I think the primary job is to think about how do I create value and how do I capture uh, some of that value in order to, uh, to do it again. In the area of intellectual property, um, we have to look at what's happening in the overall market. Uh, this graph is an interesting, quite dramatic graph growing from 1975 to 2015 and it says um, for the S&P the Standard & Poor's 500 uh, market uh, value that is the stock market value of those 500 largest companies what percentage of that market value is composed of intangibles and as you can see in 1975 it was 17 percent and by 19, uh, 2015 it was 84 percent now, intangibles here are, if I take the stock market price, the total price of the, of the stock times the number of shares, and I subtract from that the tangibles, that is the real estate, the equipment, the things you can touch and feel, what's left over? And in 2015, 84% of the value was stuff you really couldn't, quote, touch. These are called intangibles, and they include everything from brand, brand recognition to the people uh, and the intellectual capital of the people. And some portion of that intellectual capital can become intellectual property, that is something that is legally protected that you can deal with. And so when we look at large companies, um, and this is consistent across most of the marketplace, if you think 200 years ago, value uh, for industrialized countries was basically we were agrarian so it was in land ownership in the industrial revolution it became uh, value or wealth was a function of equipment and property and factories and today it's more about ideas and uh, innovation uh, 
So anyway, with that background, we, when we talk about how do we create value, let's look at what large companies do and what emerging companies. Uh, most of you on this, on this uh, webinar will be emerging company side, I would think. Large companies, though, are really not designed to innovate. Their main job is to execute the business model that they understand. They strive for predictability of results, and they operate at scale, and they try to uh, maximize economy of scale to improve profitability. Uh, that's not to say they don't have uh, research and development, and they don't look around for uh, opportunities. In fact, many large companies are beginning to understand, have begun in the last 10 years, to understand that innovation is likely to come from outside of the large companies. If we look at emerging companies, we're all about innovation. It's about you know, finding a viable uh, business model. Uh, it's about speed and iteration as we try to do that. And so how do these two things bridge? Um, and, and here's where large companies are looking to acquire uh, de-risked um, innovation that emerging companies are able to prove. That is something that technologically works with some indication of a customer acceptance. And in a sense, um, you can think of venture capital that supports emerging company as a force of out, as a form of outsourced R and D research and development. And it works sort of this way: if a large company uh, undertakes a new innovation process um, and they have to do research and development, that the costs of that are expenses that uh, are subtracted from their revenue and decrease profitability. Uh, and they don't work as quite as fast as small companies. On the other hand, if a large company acquires a small company, a smaller company, they're acquiring an asset. And that goes on the balance sheet, and it's not, it does not uh, impact negatively the um, earning, by and large, the profit and loss. And so large companies are willing to pay a premium for emerging companies that can show that they have developed innovation uh, that can be taken by the large companies and put through their sales and marketing and manufacturing processes. So it's, a, it's an interesting um, system where these uh, two coexist. So if, if we look at the S&P 500 percentage of market cap that's intangibles and we look at this slide relating to large companies, if you're in emerging companies, one of the things you need to think about is how am I creating value with intellectual property? because that's a large portion of what the large companies have. So it's important to the large companies. So with that background of, of talking about the value of IP, how can intellectual property help your, your venture? Well, first of all, as we've shown, it's a valuable asset. If you develop it thoughtfully, you can use it to raise capital. And many venture capitalists, I was in a talk yesterday, where we discuss the difference between institutional venture capital, that is people that are financial uh, players, and corporate venture capital, where uh, and what the role of IP was. And certainly for institutional venture capital, the fact is they want to know if you have some intellectual property. They may not have an ability to assess it, but they're going to want to think that you know what you're doing there. Um, and when you have uh, intellectual property, you've developed property, properly and thoughtfully, it can help increase your value to acquirers. And in fact, there is some evidence of this. A uh, company that I co-founded, IP Vision, uh, was a, uh, at one point, we were a uh, venture partner in a late stage venture fund. This would be a fund that made the last round of investments before uh, a public offering or an acquisition. And we ran um, patent uh, analytics that we developed over uh, venture-backed companies to help that venture fund determine which ones they want to invest in uh, from earlier stage venture capital. And using just publicly available data, you know, we had analyzed some 9,000 of these venture capital-backed companies. And those that scored in the top quarter of our ratings based on public data, 85% um, of them were winners in the sense that they had had gone public, had been acquired, which is an incredibly high percentage. What it is, I think, is we were looking at you know how well developed was the IP, how well managed was it, and 
that's probably um, a surrogate for uh, good management in general. And therefore, well-managed companies are likely to be winners versus those that are not well-managed. But it, it was a, there is correlation there with IP and success, financial success. And you can also, as part of your acquisition strategy, um, and I, sh I should, should have pointed out on that slide with the large company, emerging companies, that most of the venture-backed companies um, that succeed are acquired. Like the vast majority of them are acquired. So that doesn't mean that your company has to go down that route. In fact, you don't even need venture capital. Uh, but if you're going that way, then you want to be thinking about, am I telling a good story about my idea, my innovation, the market I'm addressing, and uh, am I a good manager? And so we'll talk a little bit more about the strategy part as we go through this. So with that background, what are the different types of intellectual property protection? And I've listed a, a number on the screen here. Uh, none is, of course, no protection. You haven't done anything. But sort of the first level is trade secret. That is, you have an idea and you keep it secret enough that might be a manufacturing technique or some way of doing something. And that basically can prevent others from doing it because they don't know the secret. So that's, that can be very powerful in the right circumstance. Trademark, which relates to um, the ways in which customers think about your uh, company and product, we'll talk about that in a moment. And copyright, which um, is, relates to whether uh, people can copy or, or use uh, things that you write or design. Those two uh, can enhance value, but they don't block others. In other words, uh, Coca-Cola or Coke is a trademark, um, and, and it, it protects other people from selling a product called Coca-Cola, but it doesn't prevent Pepsi from coming along with a very similar product um, and, and uh, trying to address the same market. So it can enhance value, it doesn't block others from doing the same thing, it can keep them from using your brand. And finally, patent, <coughs> which we'll talk about extensively here, uh, cuts both ways. A, a patent, as we'll talk about, is a limited time monopoly granted to the owner of the patent uh, to prevent others from um, using the invention. But in order for a person to get a patent, they have to disclose their invention. And, and the reason I say it cuts both ways is once you disclose your invention, it means other people can learn from it. And when your patent expires, you know, they can use that invention or they can take the ideas in your invention and perhaps it gives them some ideas. So it cuts both ways. And um, we'll deal that, with that in more detail. But, but let's look at the, another dimension to this. So by the way, uh, combinations of protection are available. So, for example, software in the right circumstances can be protected by both patents and copyright. So, if we look at duration, that is, how long does this protection last? A trade secret could last indefinitely um, if it's not, uh, if it doesn't uh, get disclosed. On the other hand, the patents in the U.S. anyway have a life of 20 years from the date you file the patent. And uh, the others are somewhat in between. Uh, and when we go about costs, though, it goes the other way. Because a trade secret can essentially be cost you nothing. You just have to maintain your trade secret by not disclosing it. And as we'll talk about, patents can be very expensive. Um, so that's sort of the, the overview of IP protection. Let's dig down into it a little bit. Uh, Trademarks and service marks. Uh, this is where you develop a name for yourself. A trademark is a name, uh, a word, logo, sound, color, uh, that when customers, when people hear about it, they think of you. Uh, so if I say Mercedes Benz, you think of a luxury automobile. If, uh, in fact, sound has been copied, uh, has been trademarked, uh, the, the sound of a Harley Davidson. A motorcycle is actually a trademark. So if you were to try to replicate that sound and sell a, a different type of motorcycle, uh, you would be infringing the trademark of uh, Harvey Davidson. Um, 
Um, there are, um, in the U.S., the rights to uh, trademark, uh, by the way, service mark is the same kind of thing relating to a service. So trademark is for products, service marks are for services. Uh, the rights arise in, under U.S. law from use in commerce. That is, if you use a name, a, a symbol, or whatever in, in commerce, uh, then you can claim a trademark. Uh, that's where you put the little TM next to the, uh, the term. Uh, if you register it uh, in the U.S. with the U.S. federal government, you can put an R in the circle. Um, and <clears throat> when, you, when you pick a mark, you should think of something fanciful. Uh, that's not easily uh, uh, connected uh, with with your product and you build the brand. So, for example, the idea of naming a computer app, an Apple computer is odd or perhaps Nest for a, a thermostat. Uh, those are fanciful marks. They're stronger once they're established. Uh, if, if you pick things that are merely descriptive, you may not even be able to get a mark. So companies like Storage Technology they, they store things, so that's you know, not a very strong mark. Analog devices is a very um, uh, engineering uh, advanced company in, in the Boston area, uh, and they make analog devices, so those are not strong marks. Uh, you can ask, is a mark available? Uh, in the United States, anyway, you can go to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and search their uh, their trademark database to see if somebody has registered it. Uh, I did say that uh, trademarks arise from use in commerce uh, in the last 10 or 15 years. But what used to happen is you'd have to use it in commerce, you know, do the advertising and all of that, and then file for a mark and, and hope you get it uh, registered. Uh, now there's a procedure in the U.S. called intent to use, where you file and with the federal government and you say, I intend to use this mark for these goods and services. Then you sort of reserve it. And uh, then you can go out and as you develop it uh, and actually your marketing materials and everything and get into the market, then you file something that says, well, I've actually used it now. So you sort of reserve the mark without having to take the risk that somebody's going to uh, get it before you. So that's trademark service mark. I want to, there was a question that came up before the, webinar, I'm going to back up to the slide on IP protection. All of these protections are national. That is, each country has laws relating to this. So if I have a trademark in the United States, um, that doesn't automatically protect my product in Japan or Germany or India. I have to file a trademark in country by country. Same thing with patents. Um, and that can get, all of this can take a bit of effort, but um, it's a country by country thing. Now there are treaties uh, in each of these areas uh, that allow filings of one country to sort of preserve rights for you to then file in other countries. We'll talk about that a bit when we talk more about patents, but it's country by country. So we talked about trademark and service mark. Let's look at copyright. This is the right to make copies. Um, in the United States, if I write a letter to my mother, uh, that's an original work of authorship, and I own a copyright in that. I don't actually have to register it anywhere, although in the U.S. registering it is uh, um, required if you intend to sue for infringement. Uh, copyright protects the expression of an idea. It doesn't protect the idea itself. So, and the reason is we want to encourage expression. So if Shakespeare writes a play, Romeo and Juliet, and could uh, prevent anyone else from writing a, a play about you know, that, you know, a love relationship that would uh, certainly diminish the, the uh, vitality of literature. Uh, and therefore you can't, you can't copyright that idea. You could copyright the actual words and the scenes and other things. Uh, so that other, somebody else couldn't come along and simply copy uh, a Shakespeare's work. Copyright is good for music. It's maybe a poor fit for software. We'll check, check about that. At least in the U.S., the important thing as an entrepreneur to understand is who actually owns the copyright. And 
uh, the copyright is owned by the author, the person that writes it. Uh, this could be, and um, unless that person is an employee uh, and, and who creates that work of authorship during the course of employment. So if I employ you as a software engineer uh, for network analysis and, and uh, the stuff you write there is owned by me as an employer, but if in your spare time you're doing a video game that's not related at all to my company, then you own it. Uh, the other case where um, uh, the author would not own it is if it's a work for hire, which is a specific contractual arrangement in which the person who writes the, uh, the author agrees that the person that paid them would own that right. And it's, it typically comes up in the case of consultants. So a number of years ago, I, back when I was practicing law actively, um, I had a client who was an uh, in import export and they had contracted with a third party manufacturer to um, develop, um, sorry, I'm getting these notices here. Um, they had contracted with a third party developer to develop uh, a, a computer system for, to assist them in import export, uh, record keeping and the like. And they uh, spent over a half a million dollars for that. And uh, one day they called me and said, the people that wrote the code for us are now selling it to our competitors. You have to stop it. And it turned out that they had not entered into an agreement with the third party uh, computer software company uh, declaring who would own it. And so, in fact, they could sell it. So, in the uh, US, uh, often we don't hire employees right away if we're doing something um, at early stage. So, I'm involved now in a, in a company where we have six independent contractors, and not employees, who are working on specific parts of an overall project. And these work will take anywhere from three to nine months, so we're not hiring them for full-time employees. But we do have uh, contracts with everybody about who's gonna own the work. And finally, uh, in the software area, you have to check uh, for open source issues. You can incorporate uh, open source code into your product under the general licenses there. And you wanna make sure that you uh, carefully follow that because when the time comes for you to be acquired or even maybe for financing sources, you don't really wanna buy into a lawsuit or whatever. Uh, they're gonna wanna see that you've, you've complied with all of that and there's not a problem. So that that's copyright. Uh, trade secret, again, these this is secrets you use to give you an advantage in the marketplace. Probably the most uh, uh, famous example is the formula for Coca-Cola, which supposedly is still secret and it's not easy to um, uh, reverse engineer. Uh, in the US, the protection for uh, trade secrets varies from state to state. In the US, we have 50 states uh, and those 50 states comprise the United States. So each state is a separate governmental thing and the federal government is on top. Uh, there are uniform laws in the United States. That's where the lawyers have gotten together and said this is sort of a uniform way of approaching things. Uh, each state then uh, adopts those with some variation. So you have to check to make sure if you're in California, your trade secret rules are different than Massachusetts. Uh, trade secrets last as long as you keep it secret. And uh, that's why it's important either not to disclose it or if you do disclose something, you do it under a non-disclosure agreement, a written agreement with the person uh, with whom you're sharing uh, your information. Uh, for those of you raising uh, money, don't put your trade secrets in a business plan or pitch deck. Um, don't, if it, if it requires disclosure of your trade secret to get along in the financing process and you're not approaching it correctly. You, in the financing process, you wanna talk about the benefits of what your product or service does. You don't have to tell at the beginning anyway uh, what the actual way in which you do it at, at a level that discloses your trade secret. Uh, I would say in the United States, venture capitalists most likely will not sign non-disclosure agreements uh, for a practical reason, that is, you may think your idea is unique, but I can guarantee you there's someone else doing something similar. These things come in waves, and they don't want to be, venture capitalists don't want to be 
accused of stealing your idea. Um, and so they'll say, we're not signing a non-disclosure agreement. You decide what you're gonna, what you're gonna tell us. And then <clears throat> finally, patents, which is the most complex, uh, but the strongest protection. Uh, let's talk about that. Um, again, country by country. Um, in the United States, it's granted by the federal government for any system or method that is new, non-obvious, and useful. It has to be applied for and, and issued. It's granted, again, uh, by the Patent Office, country by country. Um, it's very much like real estate. The fundamental right when you own real estate is to keep trespassers off, to keep people off your property. That doesn't mean that actually, and, and by this I mean it prevents others from making, using, selling, or distributing the patent of invention. So for example, if I have a patent on a, on a coffee cup in the United States, uh, I can prevent you from making it or selling a similar thing in the United States. Um, if I don't have a patent in China, you can go to China and make coffee cups there and sell them there. But if you try to bring those coffee cups into the US, I can prevent you from doing that. Um, so it's a right to prevent somebody from doing something. It doesn't necessarily mean you have the right to use that. Now, what do I mean by that? I think of real estate. You may have a piece of property uh, that is surrounded by other pieces of property. And if you have to walk across, someone else's land to get to your land, those other people can prevent you. Um, so it doesn't mean you can necessarily use it. Uh, the claims of a patent, I'll come back to that idea of right to use in a, on the next slide. The claims of the patent um, are like the fence around the property. They describe what the property is that you can prevent people from using. And in the United States, the duration of a patent utility patent, which is the most typical patent, is 20 years from the date you file that uh, application with the patent office. There are design patents, and that's 14 years from the date the patent issued. Those, those are very specific. Let's, uh, let's illustrate this um, right to prevent others from doing things with a simple example. Uh, let's say you patent a, a vessel to hold a liquid, and you got that patent because nobody ever thought about that idea. It's truly unique, it's clearly useful, and you get a patent on that. And I look at that and I say, gee, um, that would be a better product if I, if I could hold it you know, easier. So I patent a handle. So you have a, a vessel to hold a leak with a cup and I have a handle. There's no way that I can put my handle on your cup or you can put your cup on my handle um, unless we both agree. That is, each of us has the right to exclude the other from using our invention. And so unless we can cross license each other, <clears throat> there's not gonna be a handle on a cup or there will be litigation. And this is a good way of thinking about that. So in the US, the requirements to obtain a patent, specifically are it has to be something new, novel, and in the US, you're required to uh, tell the patent office about, quote, prior art, which is a way of saying things that are out there already uh, that are relevant to show that what you're claiming is new. Um, and I'm gonna show you how we use that prior art citations, as we call it, uh, to help understand the patent world on a slide that's gonna come up here. So it has to be something new. It has to be useful. That's usually not a problem. And in the US, it has to be what's called patentable subject matter. Uh, it's a process, machine, manufacturer, or combination of matter, or any new and useful improvement thereof. Uh, there's been a <clears throat> number of court cases in the last five, 10 years in the US uh, trying to define the scope of what subject matter uh, can be patented, including computer algorithms. Um, this will get itself sorted out at some point. Uh, and all these things you're going to want to talk to a, a patent lawyer about when, when it comes time to decide whether you want to do something. All right, so it has to be novel, it has to be useful, it has to be something that can be patented. Um, uh, for example, something that cannot be patented is, a, is like a method of accounting. Uh, clearly can't be patented, although um, a machine to, to do that could be, perhaps. Uh, so it also has to be something that you have not previously sold or publicly described. 
this this would be an enabling disclosure. So if I say to you, I've invented anti-gravity boots, and I don't tell you how I do it, that's really not enabling. An enabling disclosure doesn't tell you how to do it. So that would not be a bar to my getting a, a patent. And in most countries in the world, I would venture to say every country except the United States, if you, if you sell something or publicly describe your invention before you file in the local patent office, uh, and then you will not be able to, to obtain a patent. Again, very important. I was dealing with a, a group from Egypt, uh, very proud uh, about their technology to increase the throughput of um, uh, wireless networks by 10 times. This is at a conference in Istanbul. And I asked them if they had uh, filed a patent application. And they said, no, they were thinking about it. And I said, well, have you published anything? Oh, very proud. They said, uh, we've got a paper in a prestigious journal. And I said, oops. Depending on what that paper says, you may not be able to get a patent anywhere in the world except possibly the United States. Now, the rule in the United States is you have a one-year time period from the date that you publicly disclose or sell something, uh, one year in order to get an application on file in the patent office. If you do that, you could get a patent in the U.S., but you will not be able to file anywhere else in the world. So it was very sad to see these people who were so proud about their accomplishments trip over this relatively simple rule because they didn't know about that. So again, important takeaway, don't disclose publicly what you're doing if you intend to patent it until you've actually filed something. And then the, uh, uh, the next thing is requirement is the invention can't be something that's obvious. If it's uh, not obvious to one of ordinary skill in the art, then that's something you could patent. But if everybody else, you know, if I went to people in your field and said, what about this? And everyone said, oh, gee, that's sort of obvious. That, that might be a bar to your patent. Um, and there are ways of overcoming that, which you'll talk to your lawyer about. In the United States, we recently moved to the system that I think is around in most countries of the world, which is the first inventor to file is the one that wins. <clears throat> so if you come up with an invention uh, today, and I come up with the same invention, not knowing about what you've done uh, next month. And I uh, put a patent application on file in the US and in most countries uh, right away. And you end up filing the same invention, say three or four months from now, I'll end up winning. So it's very important to be diligent, first inventor to file. Um, so that's sort of some basics about that. Let's talk about strategy now. We've got all these different problems, these forms of IP, you know, which ones are valuable to you? What are you trying to protect? Do you have core technology? Then you might think of patenting. Um, if you have a product, uh, if you disclose how you do it uh, in a patent, is there a possibility of somebody uh, engineering around it? Uh, is the lifetime of the product or service uh, long or short if it's a an app for a mobile device that may be a very short time frame. Uh, will it be something that's profitable over time that uh, means that it's worth spending the money to patent it? And what's your business model? Are you going to manufacture and sell the product? In which case, maybe you keep things trade secrets so no one knows how you do it. On the other hand, if you plan to license or partner or be acquired, um, you might need to have some strong IP protection so that the person who licenses from you or acquires you that can, can use that as a barrier to prevent others from coming into the market that they've uh, you know, not bought, a, bought your company to address. There may be non-intellectual property bars to market entry that means you might not have to worry about it too much. There might be regulatory things or economic aspects that uh, depending on the industry. You know, for example, in the U.S. you have to have a drug approved by the Food and Drug Administration, um, and it doesn't have to be patented, um, uh, but typically it is. And we do we do know the combination of an FDA approved or public drug plus a patent keeps the, the price high, allowed to be high. And when the drug goes off patent, uh, there tends to be a bunch of companies coming in, the generics are called, who uh, can make the same thing um, 
are much cheaper and you see the stock price fall for a company. And then finally, um, you know, what's your, do you have an exit strategy that may um, uh, inform how you want to uh, proceed on an IP basis? Um, I'm going to skip this uh, slide for a moment. It'll be in the, in the, in the deck. Let's move on to, uh, before you launch um, something, typically, well, let me back up to that one. I apologize. So, uh, as a new venture, you want to think about, do you have the freedom to make, license, or sell your product or service? Are you going to infringe anybody else? Uh, can you actually do it? Uh, you have to ask, does your company own the technology? Did the inventor in the U.S., and I think in most countries, the inventor owns the patent. Uh, typically in the U.S., that's a sign that the inventor is an employee. It's a sign to the employer, and therefore the, the employer or the company owns it. In the U.S., often we license from universities, so do we have the rights there? And, of course, did it go into the public domain through disclosure? Um, all informs what strategy we're going to have. So let's start with the look before you launch, the freedom to operate. Is someone else's intellectual property actually going to prevent you ultimately from going into the market? Uh, investors are going to worry about this. Um, you should worry about it. And it's typical to get a freedom to operate opinion in the United States from a patent lawyer um, because what well, it informs you somewhat about whether someone else is out there. And then if you do happen to infringe uh, without knowing about it by having an opinion from a lawyer saying that you're free to operate, uh, uh, prevents you from uh, being hit with uh, triple damages, which is available. But I think you also need to understand this from a business perspective. What is the ISP space around your technology, your product? Um, and who else is there? Are they competitors? Are they possibly um, partners? Um, those are the kind of things, for example, my company, IP Vision, uh, does. It uh, helps people make those kind of uh, make or buy decisions. Uh, the failure to look before you launch can be fatal. You, you may not get uh, an essential license you need. All your time and effort may be wasted because somebody doesn't want to you know, allow you in the market. And investors, uh, you know, are going to run, run away if any sign of any um, lawsuit. The last time I checked, the average price of a patent lawsuit in the United States ran between three and five million dollars. And if you follow things like the Apple, Samsung litigation that's been going on around the world, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars. So, not something investors want to want to get involved with. Um, so, how do you determine whether freedom to operate? Well, you can do a search. Um, uh, there are many different places to do it. You can go to a lawyer. Um, the, one of the benefits you get from this webinar is you can use the website that uh, my company has uh, put out there. Uh, we have a free version and a paid version. It's uh, See the Forest. It's there. You see it on the screen. Uh, for entrepreneurs um, where I've given talks, uh, we provide a free upgrade for you know six or nine months. Uh, to a, a higher version of it. And I'll show you a little bit of what these patent maps that are shown below. So if you email me at the service at ipvisioning.com and then the subject line you say, Joe, upgrade, um, I'll tell you about how you can get an upgrade to this for, for free. But what is this um, thing? Uh, we do patent maps. It came from a partner of mine, a former MIT computer science and management professor, and I were doing an early stage tech commercialization out of MIT primarily. And uh, we had to, we, we do the things we now teach in entrepreneurship class. Uh, and when we got, because it was technology based, when we got to intellectual property, we put that analysis to the back end of the process because it was so expensive and painful. And uh, we got burned a few times on that. Uh, and my, my uh, co-founder who, while he was an MIT professor, had been the chief outside architect consultant for IBM for the PC-18 personal computer, the first business personal computer, and had taken one of his students, Mitch Kapoor, uh, to IBM and said, you really ought to get this software, the spreadsheet software Mitch has. And IBM said, 
uh, well, we're a hardware company. Uh, Mitch told me he would have licensed IBM exclusively for $1 million. He went on to found Lotus Development Corporation, uh, which came out with Lotus 1, 2, 3, among other things. And IBM bought the company 10 years later for $3 billion. So timing is everything. Um, he came up with this idea of mapping patents. So what is this? This is a patent map. Uh, the horizontal axis, the x-axis, is time. Each of these boxes is a patent or patent application. There's a, in the upper right corner here, we've got a little example of that. The left edge of the box is the issue date of the patent or the filing date, depending if it's an application. If it's a patent, um, I'm sorry, the publication date if it's an application. Uh, the tail is when it was filed. These are all based on US data only. Um, the, in the box, there are some information, including some numbers. This says 32 comma one. This means 32 patents were cited by this inventor as prior art. Remember when I said you have to show that your um, idea is novel? Um, those are citations of either literature or, or patents. And they're very important because if in the United States, if you, if you as an inventor fail to cite prior art of which you're aware, it can be basis for invalidation of the patent and litigation. It's deemed to be fraud in the patent office. And so these things really do matter. And what we do is we take advantage of that fact by having the lines show, showing that this patent cites this patent over here. So Virtual Inc. is a company that I use in my Nuts and Bolts and New Ventures class at MIT. You can check that out at nutsandbolts.mit.edu. And when they first issued their patent, they cited 41, it was 41, where is it here? Yeah, 40, 40 other patents as prior art. And these are all the patents they cited. And so very quickly, by looking at who owns them and looking at the titles, you can begin to understand what the space looks like. You can, uh, do these maps by doing keyword searches or putting in company names and seeing what they look like. Uh, interestingly enough, a few years later, this map in the bottom right that I'm going to bring up shows that patent. And uh, after that patent was issued, there were other patents that came and cited it. So you begin to see the whole immediate light, uh, patent citation landscape around it. Using these techniques, you can begin to understand not only are there freedom to operate issues, but what other people are in the market? You know, how does that affect where I'm going to enter the market and what kind of products I'm going to do? So take a look at it and hopefully you'll find it useful. So let's switch now to sort of some mechanics around obtaining a patent in the US and determining what to patent, determining when to file, preparing applications and prosecuting. Um, what to patent is probably the most important step. Uh, there's a tendency, especially among technology people, to want to patent any interesting thing that they've done. And uh, so you shouldn't really ask, could I get a patent on this? You should really ask, this is something that's valuable. This has helped me create value. Will this help me capture value from an acquisition? Uh, and, you know, how would the, my competitors use my technology if I didn't patent it? And so... Those are business level discussions. And so don't rush immediately to say, oh great, I could get a patent on this, and put it on, on, my, on the wall or whatever. Ask, does it help me create value? Because I just remember, that's what you're supposed to be doing, creating and capturing value. Um, you should file, of course, in the US uh, uh, before you lose US or foreign rights. Um, now, there is a patent cooperation treaty, which most countries in the world are, are signatories to. And it's a little complex, but essentially if I file a patent application in the US and I file and designate it as a PCT, a patent cooperation treaty filing, um, and I can then have that treated as a, uh, an application for all the countries in the world in which I wanna you know, file or potentially file, and I designate that on the form. Um, so that's, that's how you preserve rights. Um, in the U.S., as I said, uh, we switched to a first inventor to file, so being diligent about this is now important. Um, and of course, you want to make sure you get it filed before you put the 
product or service out in the market. Um, an important um, advance um, in the U.S. in the last 10 years, remember I said that in the U.S. you have one year from the date of disclosure uh, to, to get a patent application on file, but that actually is a problem for the rest of the world. Uh, they came up with a thing called a provisional patent application, which is treated, I believe, most countries in the world as a filing. And why it's important for entrepreneurs is um, you can make a filing, uh, a provisional, it can be done quickly, and it's cheap. You see there it's $70 uh, uh, filing fee in the U.S. It does not have to have claims in it. It simply requires a meaningful description of the invention. It establishes your filing date priority. And what it does is it gives you one year um, in the U.S. in order to get uh, what's called a utility patent on file. So if you file a provisional, you have 12 months to get the full filing on. This gives you time to go out and uh, know that your idea is, is potentially protected and to uh, start talking to people about it and decide whether there's commercial interest in it. Uh, nothing happens at the, at the patent office. Um, it's not published, it doesn't become public, um, so it can be done very effectively. Um, now, the lawyers will say, well, you really should do a full utility application, you know, with bells and whistles, and sure, if you have unlimited time and money, it's always better to do that. But most of us have to make trade-offs on how much things cost, etc. And time is important for our inventor, for our inventors who are developing the products, etc. Um, so provisional is something I've used where we, in IP Vision, the, the map that I showed you, we were a software as a service, and we would uh, uh, come up with new releases every four to six, four to six weeks. And before we release something, we'd have a meeting and say, but what did we do that we think is commercially valuable that we might want to file a patent application on? What did we think about doing but did not implement that came up? And then we would file a provisional patent application you know, when we did like six or seven of these over the course of a year, basically maintaining the, an option for us to file a full application. Um, and so it's very effective. And eventually, we, well, within a year, we had to then you know, decide whether we were going to invest the additional money, but we had more information at that point. One of the drawbacks of provisionals is you've got to make sure that your description at the beginning is, is broad enough. So if I say, um, let's say nobody had ever determined that fruits and vegetables were good for you, and I made this wonderful discovery in about how to make them healthy and you know, process them or something. And in the course of the year, um, I file a provisional on that. In the course of the year, I also determine that protein, meat, is, is important. Well, I can't add that into my full patent application and get the earlier date because I didn't talk about it back then. So I would have to file it. You know, it would only go to the date that I filed a provisional around the use of protein. So there is a risk that if you're not broad enough, that you're not going to be able to get the priority. But um, I think that's worth the effort in most cases. I've even seen uh, people take papers they're going to give at a technical uh, conference and put a cover page on it and send it to the patent office uh, in order to maintain rights. So provisionals are very uh, good for entrepreneurs. Um, if you haven't seen a patent, it's, it's like a, a term paper. Um, it describes the field of the invention. There's a background part that says, you know, what is it out there that I find needs fixing, you know, what's broken, and how do I fix it, and what's the advantages that I have uh, over the, what's there before. Uh, and I'm supposed to, in the U.S., give the best mode of practicing my invention. You know, it doesn't have to be what you ultimately do, but at the time you go through the patent process, what's the best way of, of doing this? And again, that's part of the bargain that says we'll give you a limited time monopoly if you, if you disclose your invention. And then finally, the claims. What exactly is your invention? What is it you're going to end up protecting? Patent costs. Uh, in the U.S., uh, the legal fees are anywhere from five to 15000 for a lawyer to prepare. You've got to manage the process. I'll give you some hints on that at the end of the, the talk. I had, uh, knowing this, I had my co-founder was uh, 
busy talking to the lawyer and not telling me and ended up with a $35,000 bill. So you've got to control that process. Filing fee in the U.S. is, is modest, at least, um, depending on the size, whether you're large, medium, or small. And once it's in the patent office, it's hard to predict what it's going to cost, but you should think about it costing a minimum of five to 15 plus thousand dollars in the U.S. patent office. It's not fees you pay to the patent office, it's the fees you pay to your lawyer who has to deal with the patent office and the objections, et cetera. And that's a little bit, that's why even once it's filed, you've got to decide, am I getting anywhere? Is this worth the money? Uh, international patent uh, fees um, vary country by country, can be very expensive. Uh, at the bottom of this slide, there's a statement, the Government Accounting Office study, that's a government accounting office in the U.S., looked at uh, a small company, for example, um, and a patent, a series of patents, uh, and if, those, if a patent were filed in 10 industrialized countries, what would it cost the small company over the life of the patent? And that, this was in the early 2000s, 2003 or four. And the conclusion was anywhere from 300,000 to 500,000 dollars. That includes the lawyer's fees, the initial filing fees. You have to maintain the patent by filing um, well, periodically in the US at uh, three and a half, seven and a half, and 11 and a half years. Many countries, it's sort of a yearly or monthly even filing, I think, in some. So if you add all that up, it ranges from 300,000 to 500,000, some 15 years ago. Uh, so they're expensive. So you don't want to necessarily file everything. But I think the combination of, if you go back to the original slide about creating value and capturing value, if you're building a company that you think the exit is likely to be an acquisition, you need to be telling the story both about your, uh, your ideas, your market, your, your customer acceptance, and the fact that you've got these patent applications pending out there. I just signed up a deal in, in last June with a major consumer products company in the United States, the company that, that I co-founded. And you know, fortunately, we had a bunch of applications, well, we planned a bunch of applications on file uh, from a couple of years ago. And the week before we finally signed the, the deal, uh, we got notified that our patents, one of our patents had issued in the United States, in Europe, and in China. And that made a big difference in uh, uh, getting that deal done uh, on terms that we found uh, uh, acceptable. Because for the large company, they knew at least there would be a patent out there. Before it was, okay, you've got all these applications, but how do I know what happens if they don't issue? And we just took that off the table. So the timing was wonderful. But we did have uh, the optionality there so they could continue to prosecute that. Um, now, because patents are expensive, you need to think about, is there another way to deal with IP? And there's two sides to this. One is um, avoid being picket fenced, I call it. So a fence around your property. A picket fence is a group of patents that surround a patent for the purpose of blocking the commercial implementation. So for example, let's go back to the vessel to hold a liquid. I might come along and say, hey, you know, I could put a cap on that. And that would make it commercially interesting. I could put a sleeve on it. I could put a handle on it. And maybe I make it out of insulating material. And I might go and, or somebody or a group of people might end up filing all those patent applications and getting patents on that. And what effect we could have done would be steal the value of some of the value of your invention because you can't really do the things you need to get to the commercial implementation. You just have a vessel to hold a liquid. And you don't want, you do not want to be in that position. That's like a problem. So how do you prevent that? Well, one of the things I mentioned is you have to, in order for someone to get a patent on the cap or the sleeve or the handle or whatever, they have to show that it's not been done before or, or nobody's disclosed that. So one way to prevent you from getting picket fenced is to actually disclose that. If you believe in talking to your patent lawyer and doing your prior art searches that you have a core invention that's really strong and you can get a good patent on it and you don't have the money to spend on all these side patents, then simply disclose it. Say, my vessel is great and you could do lots of things with it. You could put a cap on it, you could put a sleeve on it to insulate your hand, you could put a handle, you can make it out of all sorts of materials. 
And then once you've disclosed that, nobody else can claim those things as their invention because, hey, you told them. And so that's a very can be a very effective thing if you've got a core technology and you and your lawyer figure out that this can get a really strong patent on. An example, using an IP vision patent map of a picket fence, this is a landscape patent map of uh, a, a patent from Ring. Ring is a company in the US that sells video doorbells, internet controlled video doorbells from your mobile device. Um, you can see who's at the front door. Well, when we did a patent map uh, of this, and said, well, who's citing this patent? There are a bunch of red boxes on this map. It turns out these are all patents filed by Skybell, which is a competitor. And so they filed a whole bunch of implementations um, around this. And you can just see visually there, uh, even without reading it, there's a lot going on there that uh, you know, potentially blocks Ring. Now, it turns out Ring, through other um, reasons, got acquired for a hefty price. But I don't think the story's over on the patent litigation that may come from this. Anyway, the message here is avoid the picket fence. So practical advice, sort of wrapping up here. Um, what can you do? Well, with your employees, you want to have invention disclosure and assignment agreements for people that are your inventors, saying you're going to disclose what they've done and, and uh, will agree to assign that invention to you as an employer. Uh, typically, these also uh, require the employee to say what inventions they've had before, maybe from another company, so you don't infringe. If you're using consultants, you want a consultant agreement specifying that the work is going to be a work for hire and it's going to be owned by you, the, the company that employed the consultant. You may want to use non disclosure agreements where appropriate to preserve your rights. You want to avoid infringement. You want to Keep an idea, uh, look at the uh, freedom to operate and must continue to understand the patent landscape. Uh, you can do that with our see the forest thing, uh, run it and maps every week usually because patents in the US come off weekly. Um, and you want to try to preserve patent rights um, uh, in the most cost effective way you can using things like provisional patent applications um, and make sure that you get all those applications on file as soon as possible because of the first uh, inventor to file and make sure you don't disclose stuff before you file. And then you want to think about avoiding the picket fence problem. Um, and all of that together is a story that you can tell about, help you tell a story about the value you've created and how you're going to capture that uh, that will make you more valuable. And then finally, how do you deal with lawyers? Well. Um, you're typically buying expertise by the, by the hour, and so you want to be very disciplined, not only for IP, but for other reasons. It's perfectly okay to go to a patent lawyer and say, here's my lab notebook, write me a patent. It's going to cost you a lot of money. If you're thinking about patenting, you should read some patents in your space. You should spend some time drafting, not the claims necessarily, but um, a description of what it is. What is the problem that you saw that cause you to make this invention. Um, and, and write um, something that's, that's detailed enough that uh, the lawyer can take and then spend the expertise in the claims. The claims is what you really want the expertise at. Um, and uh, that way you can uh, streamline the, the, the whole process. And don't wait until the absolute last moment. If you file a provisional and you decide you're gonna go and file the utility patent, don't wait until two weeks before the year runs out because First of all, the lawyer is busy, won't get their full attention, their job, they may not do as good a job, and they're gonna charge you a lot. You know, if you're thinking of patenting it, you know, give them some advance notice so they can get it on the calendar, so to speak. And uh, someone reminded me that um, I have a good uh, thing called 10 Commandments of How to Work Effectively with Lawyers. Uh, you can see that on the nutsandbolts.mip.edu website, or if you get a copy of this, deck that link will take you there. So what we've covered is the value of intellectual property, the types of IP, some IP strategies, some patent basics, some practical advice. I hope you found that useful. Um, you can uh, contact me uh, by email at either of these addresses and um, uh, I wish you luck in your, in your ventures. I don't know if we have time for any questions. I'll, uh, 
leave that open to anyone. Uh, otherwise, I will uh, uh, sign off and, and wish you a, a good adventure in your in your ventures. Okay, no questions, then uh, enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>